Welcome to the Two Months Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter in 3%, in which we take one giant book, break it down bit by bit, section by section, analyze it, talk about it, have fun. I'm Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. Hi, Chad. Uh, oddly enough, I just got back from a hike, and uh, I'm wearing blue, and you're wearing red. This is like Double Dare or something. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> for, for, for those that uh, are not that are only listening, I, I have on a blue shirt, and Chad has a very red shirt. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's like it's like Crips in the Bloods, and we need Sean Penn and whoever else is in that movie colors to to solve problems for us. Because <laughs> you know what, if, some, if something is going to fix a problem, it's going to be the LAPD. That oh, every time, every time I saw this yesterday um, uh, with some people I met where they're talking about Peppa Pig. Because I was complaining about all these dumbass shows that I have to watch um, that Alex watches, and they're like, "Oh well, Peppa Pig, you know, Peppa Pig's fine." And I was like, "I'm so over Peppa Pig." Last summer when he was watching that all the time, there's one episode where it's like, "We need to be nice to the police. The police are our friends," and I was like. We're over, Peppa. It's it's time. Like I don't know what the fuck England's police are like, but I'm not. No, I'm. We're not going there. <laughs> there's, uh, there's half my city is on fire because of your fucking police. I smoke pigs. I ain't friends with them. I really. I had this idea the other day after the Euro Cup. We were walking home, and there's like cops trolling around all over. And I was like, it would be awesome if every time you saw a cop, instead of like yelling something harassing, you just yell, "Defund yourself!" <laughs> over and over again. Because it's like the least offensive thing. You can't really get in trouble for that, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> like if you call them a pig, they're, they'll shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And oddly enough, you know, we're, uh, oh, well, while we're on Peppa Pig, I should say, uh, my daughter, we were at a swimming pool, and this German couple was living in our building, and they go, so wait, you, you and your wife sound American, but your daughter, she's English? And I'm like, oh, no, she watched Peppa Pig when she was three. <laughs> oh, okay, that makes sense now. Because <laughs> she'd say something like, holiday. where are you going on holiday? <laughs> the seaside resort. Yeah. On the trolley. <laughs> now uh, now, now she watches uh, teen, teen Titans Go and yeah. this Russian propaganda show called Masha and the Bear. Masha and the Bear is very terrifying to me. I have I, – okay, I have – <laughs> I want to develop, I need to watch more of it, but I have a developing theory about what's going on between that bear and Masha. Um, and I, I feel like all these shows are unnerving. Well, that one, if you're in a translation, that one has some interesting translations sometimes. Very <laughs> You're like, who's, who's doing this? Uh, Alex is going to Go Go Rangers, as he calls it. Okay. Like Dino Power Rangers. Who knows? Who cares? So anyway, we get to spoil everything in this one, right? This is the penultimate final. Not even penultimate, just final. Just the final. All right. Just the final, final section. <laughs> yeah. So we we Frank is supposed to join us. Um, and we're hoping that he'll come on anytime now and we'll just log him in. Um, but otherwise, we are covering the last section of the third volume of Vernon Subutex in which everyone dies. Well, yeah, I guess with enough time, everybody does die. And so yes. With enough time. Everybody but Vernon dies in one moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, most of them. Yeah. In <laughs> It cut, the ending of this, it kind of reminded me of, there's a terrible, it's it's good, but it's terrible um, Norm MacDonald joke about 9-11. And someone says like, dude, you can't, you can't joke about that. And he goes, what? I was wading through blood and bone looking for my brother in the streets of Manhattan. I could joke with however I want. And this is basically how this one is. It's just a pool of blood and bones with Vernon on the bottom of it, just everything piled on his face. Yep, yep, <laughs> big explosion. So keep... enjoy your ending. <laughs> Everyone dies. It reminds me of um, in a backwards way, and that it doesn't. This doesn't. This metaphor doesn't hold. But that red, white, and blue trilogy from the that Polish director who did the Decameron mm -hmm. um, some years ago, uh, and where all there's all these three movies that are sort of connected. They're thematically linked through colors, and then at the very end, you find out that everyone who is part of them was on a cruise ship that dies mm -hmm. or something like that. It's a boat. I don't know. It, it probably not a cruise ship, but it's a boat. They all die. Um, and, or maybe some of them get rescued. I can't remember. Whoever's watching this, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, fuck it. Who cares? Anyway. So for anyone who didn't read this section, we threw a oblique entrance point with a character we've never met before who is friends with Antoine. Um, 
is talking about how Antoine died in this shooting at this church. And we start to figure out that everything went wrong at the convergence that Celeste wanted to have happen, where they'd have like their church of, of, of musicians and have another convergence and come out of this like funk that the group has like found themselves in after they sort of got broken apart. And then we get the, the, the woman Solange who is convinced by Max online uh, to basically go and massacre everyone. Again, he sets her up with, with uh, grenades and I believe assault rifles and everything. And then you get Vernon, who's the only survivor, but is per, people think is dead, who is living with, um, oh my God, Marsha, who is the Brazilian uh, transvestite from the first uh, volume that he fell in love with at Kiko's. She rescues him from a train station that she finds him in after he's like crawled through literally, like you said, blood and guts and bones and bodies to make it out of this cathedral where where Solange came in, you know, grenades ablaze and, and just blew people, blew everyone apart. And that's, and that's that. <laughs> the end, there is like a proto history thing, like you said though, too. And then he, then he becomes not a father, but like kind of a surrogate guardian for Aisha and her son. Yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah. So then the, the last chapter is like a forward through time. Yeah. Thing, which I think is supposed to be a nod to, I don't remember exactly which Welbeck book, but it reminds me of a Welbeck book mixed with like uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yeah, it kind of has elements too of um, the ending of uh, AI. It was supposed to be Stanley Kubrick's uh, film. He died during the production of it and Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg did it. But the end of it, um, you know, it's supposed to be Pinocchio, the Pinocchio story, but the end of it flashes forward like thousands and thousands and thousands of years to show the evolution and the destruction of humankind and the rebirth and the, and you get it, this like this really quick epilogue. Um, it's and, and in some ways too, it reads like on uh, a Chebe's things fall apart. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's like a different, it's a different narrator that has a different perspective on something and gives you a bunch of everything you just read. You get two paragraphs that explain all of it. And then what, what the result is, it's like this, Foot, the, the footnote of history, which is the three books we just read, is this footnote, right? Isn't there like the opening to Handmaid's Tale isn't dissimilar from that? Either. Well, maybe. Yeah. It's been 20 years. The, um, the, the thing that's most <laughs> noteworthy, I suppose, about this future history is that they essentially ban music because, uh, because Vernon like, has opened up the gateway to the mind and like <laughs> transformed everything and music is dangerous. So people have like these these rogue raves and then like the government's all cut down and are like, no, no more for you. And there's a sect of Vernon Subu tax. We do find out his real name, actually. We thought we didn't, but we do. It's at the very uh, end of Marsha's section. Um, but they, and Aisha, he lives, like you said, he lives on an island with Aisha and her daughter. And then as like years in the future, her daughter's like part of, uh, or her descendants are part of like a um, political government situation trying to like restore the rights to music i thought um you know not to toot our own horns we do we do most things very terrible but um i was surprised at how well we pinned down the idea of disciples um mm -hmm. john the baptist mm -hmm. and jesus like nailed all of that and then our talk about um everything in this one is uh based around currency and they take this massacre and this this morbid uh, satire that she does with it, where it becomes a TV show that makes a bunch of money and, yep. and Dopele wins. He makes all the money. He gets all like, all the. It's like this is we could anything with your name on it, Vernon. It's 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 worth money. It's so great, isn't this wonderful? And he's just like, oh Jesus, I'm out of here. Yeah, <laughs> you <been> completely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like it goes just ham. It, she she like pushes it into this you know ham fisted satire of like money and rights and this and that. It's like it's kind of like sick and disgusting and hilarious all at the same time. Uh, which which of course it has to end that way with the characters that are involved and everybody and just everybody that's trying to do something beautiful is ripped apart and drowning in their blood. And, it, and, and everyone like, who's yeah. a person is making boatloads of money. And, and, the evil, and evil prevails. And yeah. Evil always wins. That's what I heard growing yeah. up. And if you're, you know, and if you're not 
if you're not in line and if you're not uh, marching to the right beat and if you're dancing a little bit different, we can't have that. So that's all has to be illegal now. So, yeah, yeah, like like in Footloose. <laughs> At a church. <laughs> church. The church is involved in that too. That's true. It is, isn't it? And then, and then the sheriff shoots everyone. So, what, what did you think about uh, the landing on this for how we how we finished? I, I, I've, this is a part that I remembered the best. Like okay. even before we started, and I knew everything would coalesce here. And mm -hmm. so it was more about the journey this time, the ending. The first time I was like what is going to happen here? And like, I assume like something would go wrong or, or I thought it would just fade away. Like there's a, an equal chance that it wouldn't be something like, like the, the world ends in fire or in, in, you know, entropic death, whatever that yeah. is the T.S. Eliot line, I think. Um, but I, uh, I thought, well, it could be like, you know, tie into like all the, the, the bad people who are involved, all of the, like the terrorist attacks that are referenced, all that stuff. Or it could just be like, yeah, nobody shows up anymore. And Vernon just sort of dies of a heart attack at one of these raves. And that's it. It didn't didn't make any big difference. Nothing, nothing changed. Just cocaine heart explosion when the beat drops. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's how I plan on going out, man. Instead, it's literal explosion with heads being decapitated from the bodies. Yep, exactly. It's like a, it's like a Rick and Morty death scene. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah, so I did, so it was less like this time it was less like paying attention to that part and more of like how did all of this get there where every one of these characters is fucked and like mm -hmm. they're and not just by being killed but like they're all like in various ways like taken over like there's a brief moment it's like the thing that I always uh whenever I get drunk I like not whenever but when I'm drunk sometimes I like to talk about the pension books as being in the 60s as being the last moment where like things could have gone a few different ways. Like yeah. there's a chance that like the people in control wouldn't have retained control. There's a chance that like this outside movement could have changed things. And like the pension books, like Gravity's Rainbow, are all of that, like on the, the people on the side that are like just close, if things had break a different way, if possibilities happen in a different way, then the power structures don't coalesce and take everything over. And this had that feel for so long of like, eh, maybe, 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 and you know it's not. And so watching it not happen this time was more like a slow collapse of like everything being locked back in and locked back in, locked back in, and then down the ultimate way. But it's it's one of the more depressing like thought structures you can get into is that really there's no way everything's predicted and, and controlled now. Like even when we have like Black Lives Matter riots for like a, a riots uh, protest for a very long time and up and stuff. <sighs> It still feels like we're not there. Everyone else is the police is still in control. Everything else is still in control. Yeah. Not to Peppa Pig this too much. <laughs> not to Peppa Pig it too much. <laughs> what did you think though? Because this is your first time. Yeah. No. Um. I. You know. There's pros and cons. I, I think like the pros is she earned everything that is at the that at the end of it. There's there's forewarning there's setup and there's payoff and it's not like just like dropping something in your lap and then the con to that is that in some ways you do the seams do show and it does telegraph a little bit mm -hmm. um which you know that's okay i mean like this whole thing like the second half is like all the the death of artists like yeah. over and over like every every week it's a or any artist they bring up is dead like prince yeah 2006 was a shitty year oh yep. david bowie's dead lemmy's dead like just dead, dead, like so you're getting that. right. So I mean, here's it all really did happen though, too. What's that? It all really did happen. Yeah, but, but what I mean though is that um, so you're getting like the death of artists and these important things to them, and at the same time you're having all of the uh, xenophobia in um, in Europe, and yeah. then you're having all the fascism, the rising fascism there as well, and nationalism there as well so like this control like, like it's circling around them and then she's adding in the different terrorist attacks that are happening all over the place and then you have this church that has something good and pretty and they're all going to get in a big group somewhere and so it's kind of so yeah so it's kind of like where what are we and and freaking poor poor celeste is re not recovered but she's able to be human again yeah right and she's having this like beautiful moment 
And it's like, oh no, every time this happens, <laughs> there's a pattern here. Every time this happens, oh, it all goes goes terrible. So I mean, she's, she earned everything she set up and she paid off everything that she did. But at the same time for me, like it's a tiny bit of a con because you lose, it's, it's, uh, it's inevitable, but not necessarily unexpected. Right. And so I love, I love the inevitability, the inevitability of the, uh, of how it ends, but not necessarily unexpected, but that's okay. Yeah. And it is just kind of like life right now. Yeah. I mean, totally. is it like there are like 300 people killed in mass shootings over 4th of July weekend. Like, I mean, I, I forgot, I, I shouldn't say I forgot, but like you get, you get so many of these bodies piled up. You forget like, oh yeah, Orlando. Good God. How could I forget Orlando? That one was a really important one to me. So when I was in Marfa, the day that I gave my, my reading at the Marfa bookstore there was the day after that shooting. Mm -hmm. So like I had that one really locked in my mind. It's and like, you were reading that homophobic essay that you had. It really read, was not the right time. I read about monster porn. <laughs> about people no, reading monster porn. So yeah. like, yeah, pretty not great. Like bad timing <laughs> all around. <laughs> but alas, like. And the problem with homosexuals you see is that they can do it in the open now. Am I right? And like everybody's, uh, this is Chad, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was oh, it was horrifying. I was like, I am so sorry that you're all here in some way. Yeah, like you. But yeah, that was when it, like gets kind of lost a little bit. How how do the arts? I mean, this is a whole nother topic. But how do the arts respond to a world like this? So I was thinking, yeah, I, absolutely. I was thinking, Are you inspired as an artist to create art after you know the next mass shooting, the next you know condo collapse, the next whatever, the next calamity, or. I guess it's one of those things like do you do you create out of moments of sorrow or do you create out of like an exuberance of joy? Because either one can be a place to to blossom and grow something, right? But I guess that's who you are as a person. But I find it hard after this stuff going on, like to oh, I want to create something beautiful myself. Well, isn't, this. It, isn't your novel essentially predicated upon the yes. proliferation of these events? <laughs> like, yes, it is actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, there you go. There you go. That's like, there's an answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it, the, uh, oh God. There's so but much. It actually, it, it does to not to like telegraph what I'm what I'm working on, but um, it it does it does go with that idea of every like so many things that we have, especially within capitalistic structures, are built on the foundations of blood and death and torture. Um, and you're seeing that with the ending of this, where this horrible tragedy takes place at this beautiful event, and they're cashing in on it. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. that's that's horrible. But that's yeah, that's the that's way the, things work. It's the like, way things work. D Disneyland is on top of a pile of bones, metaphorically, <laughs> just just Probably terrible. Literally. <laughs> Maybe literally too. There might be some people in the foundation of it. I don't know. <laughs> I would put it past. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, or, you know, with mine being about Las Vegas, like, you, what do you think Las Vegas is built on? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, sorrow, it's tragedy, and it's terror everywhere. And soon to be the Oakland A's. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely true. There was, I was reading, um, I started re-listening to, or listening to Underworld, the Don DeLillo book. So I haven't read it in decades, since it came out, actually. And, uh, Chloe read it this year and really loved it. And I was like, you know, I should really read really read that. Don't really remember it that well. But um, it reminded me that uh, there's a point where I stopped reading all Don DeLillo books. And it was the one about 9-11. And there was that big thing at that point in time where, like, when 9-11 happened, like, don't write a book about 9-11. Like, that's, you, it's too close. You can't do that. And the same way that people are, what's her name? Uh, right? So those kind of, like, wink, wink, nod, nod, funny, funny essays. Um Shit's her name. Super popular. She used to be a publicist. Uh, she had an essay at the beginning of the pandemic where it's like, all you writers are stuck at home. Don't write about the pandemic. It's horrible. It won't be good writing, blah, 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 blah. Like there, there are always like those reactions to these things. And in some ways, like this book is like right on that level. Like for us, like the Bataclan and like the things that are like that are seemingly a long time ago, but they weren't when this was written in French. What frightened me the most um, in this book is um, 
Europe's fear of immigration and the way she um, illustrated that in this. And that's to me is, especially coming out of uh, this first four years of Trump, it just feels so like spot on with the, the feeling that a lot of people here have that's growing. Um, and I mean, there's, al there's always the violence piece. We're America, we have violence, we're good on that. But <laughs> we've always been pretty uh, xenophobic. Pretty yeah, um, but just like this, this nationalistic wave, like how much it's crashing on top of us right now, uh, I, that really freaks me out and hits hits home perfectly. I think um, that's that's the really scary portent that's in this book. I think. Yeah, and the way you said the first four years of Trump is terrifying because, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we'll, we'll see how that comment ages. But yeah, the fact that that person's popular and has a following or has people that still would follow it like good god yeah 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 it's ter that is terrifying one of the things i thought was was well done in a slightly more subtle way for the ending is we do get patrice's uh sort of uh not uh he doesn't get redeemed but he's sort of redeemed like his his viewpoints are now like changed he's altered yeah. it did happen and one thing that he keeps saying is like, I don't understand why with all these women have been raped. I don't understand why there are armies of women with hunting knives disemboweling guys just to restore calm. And like these mentions that he has of like, why isn't there a woman just like out there fucking murdering all these awful men? And then like the next chapter is this woman going and like blowing apart all the people, but it's the wrong people. But it's like, but they're not the wrong people because people like him would have fallen into that camp and he's there. So they're, yeah. they're it's a wrong, it's wrong. And yet, uh, it's like a little bit of a moral tension there. Where in his section, you're like, "Yeah, why not?" I mean, when when Celeste, when all the women are like, "Oh yeah, Celeste is going to be going through some shit." Like we understand. And he's like, "Does this happen to all of you?" <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah." I know it was from uh, the very end of last week's section, but um, I think like kind of. I don't want to sound academic, but a thesis statement for definitely this book, but the entire trilogy I think is on 299. Um, I'll, I'll read this the paragraph, not just the uh, not just the sentence for the setup. Um, but uh, it's when people are starting to come see Celeste to see how she's doing um, mm -hmm. after being uh, beat up and raped uh, right in the middle. Daniel came. He is the first person to talk to her normally. There's no concerned hug or knowing look. He simply said, long time no see, with that smile she loves, that laid back, laddish smile. Celeste found him more handsome than she remembered. From his nonchalance, she assumed that terrible things must have happened to him too. He had that delicate politeness of people who know that evil truly exists. And when it happens to you, it happens to you. No point vetching about it. Yeah. And it kind of goes along with that, um, the essay that helped um, Virginine get some, you know, a little bit of healing or solace or closure from her rape, uh, where it was the Camille Paglia just like, look, if you're going to go outside, you can get raped. And that's just, yeah. the, that's, it's out there. So, yep. I don't know what we're going to do about it, but all right. It's like this world is super screwed up and it's super messed up and daniel's and, and that's the one person that she's like really into is i, I found it was really interesting that relationship that they have where you know he's just like hey <laughs> like that's yeah. it uh, <laughs> hey haven't seen you in a while the, anything new it, anything new what's going on <laughs> the sort of uh cheesy yet uh yeah maybe maybe part of it um this is going to be kind of cheesy. I don't care. I'm just going to go with it anyways. But um, sort of artistic statement that goes behind this along with that thesis is that in the in the face of the fact that that's what's going to happen, we're not going to be able to stop the violence. We're not going to be able to stop the xenophobia. We're not going to be able to stop the people in power. They're not going to stop exploding us. There's never going to be a way to win. You can think there is, but really, like, that's a pretty fucking long shot until, like, there's some global-ass catastrophe. But... And nevertheless, like the best you can do is make little pockets of music for like a night 
when people okay. like come together and have their dance and have their their thing and they carry that with them it's, it is like the religious thing again of like the jesus and the disciples and spreading the word of that or whatever but at the same time with the like, with like books with like any artistic enterprise like it's kind of the best you can do you can't really you can like a lot of i believe a lot of gen z people think that you can write art that will socially change they'll uh, amount to social justice change and I don't think that that's they're gonna. I think they're gonna be very burnt out on that within a few years, and they find out that it's not true, um, and that people have been doing similar things for eons, and the world doesn't care as much about art as it does commerce and slavery. So like the the uh, and exploitation. So it's not gonna work out. So like the best you can do is just make something that has some bit of hope or some bit of like momentary solace, and then it will get eaten up too. But at least it was there for a minute. Yeah. Maybe get outside and take a walk or something. <laughs> don't get away from the TV for a little bit. Leave your phone <laughs> in the car. Just take a walk for a little bit. Don't I did, watch I, Walking Dead religiously. Yeah, I did that today and it helped a lot. Like I was feeling a little depressed after finishing this. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I went for a hike with my my wife and daughter, and I was like, oh, this is this is really nice. I need this. <laughs> this yeah. is this is good. Yeah, that's, that's, I walked to Walmart here in Rutland, Vermont. Which is, <laughs> yeah, don't walk to Walmart. To don't do that. Pens were in there, but like, yeah, evil's out there. It exists, and it's gonna get you. And when it gets you, don't don't be bitching and moaning about it. Come on, go dance. <laughs> there we go. Wait, what I mean? <laughs> there, there's our no. I'm kidding. That, there's our magnet. There's our meme magnet. You can put on the <laughs> the entire book. <laughs> I mean, it was like that. That it, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, it shows up so many times, but alas. So as a whole, you 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 feel she she earned the three volume nine one thousand pages. Um, no. Interesting. I I don't think it need to be that long necessarily, but I I enjoyed the ride, so I'm not gonna. I don't care. Like yeah. if it's a short ride or a long ride or mean like I don't care. Like it was a fun all I know is a fun ride. And so I mean it mean, doesn't have to be that long either. Yeah. <laughs> it could it could definitely be one book. I, I think probably breaking into three makes more sense like a marketing type thing. Like you can have the volumes. Um I I get that aspect of it. One giant tome would be kind of cool because it'd be like a Bible, right? Yeah. Like a infinite just size. Yeah, I, I think that would have been kind of sweet to just have a, a big fat freaking Bible of a book and the, the mythology of it's all right there in one spot. But I don't care. It's it's good. It's it's not something I normally read. It's not something that I write, and so I like that's the kind of stuff I really like. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't watch, I can't say it changed. What's that? Are you gonna watch the TV show? Um, I guess if I can find Canal Plus or whatever, but I don't. I don't watch a lot of French topic, topic, or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't. What's your What's uh, your diagnosis? Um, uh, topics most famous show, but um, the what surprised the, you most with it then? With because uh, like you know, it sounds like you liked it as well. Um, I like I like this I like this form of storytelling. Like there's mm -hmm. reading this uh, Schlafsky theory of prose new translation called on theory of prose. Um, I think I mentioned this on an earlier. Uh, podcast i'm gonna i'm gonna fill in the blanks to this dumb story but there were multiple files of the tr new translation of the schlafsky book and i got the wrong one laid out and proofed the wrong one so i'm rereading it now with the right translation just super fucking annoying in so many ways but it's all about like the structures of like how prose is written and how things mm -hmm. function and so reading that alongside something like this is always is really interesting reading alongside most anything is interesting yeah but like his examples are like you know don quixote and sherlock sure. holmes and charles dickens mysteries and for something that's new and that has a different sort of sensibility than like a lot of those things it's interesting because there are elements that do reflect on it like the sort of step nature of like of like fairy tale telling where you move from one character to another to another that has to accomplish certain things to get the original thing taken care of. So like Alex Bleach's tapes go through like five different characters to get to Alex Bleach's tapes. Like that yeah. sort of way that these things fundamentally end up working is really fascinating to me, but I really just am a sucker for individual vignette style 
points of view. And yeah. like going from from this, I look because I keep track of this stuff. I've read like vast majority of books by women this year, and that they mostly fit more towards that side. And I've found that like sometimes going from something like this to a book that's written by a male, especially fiction that has like a universal eye that is the the narrator and the teller feels really oppressive. And that this book doesn't feel oppressive at all. So reading yeah. it was just purely joyful and mm -hmm. like and like it's disturbing and there's shit in here that's like real on point with like people's characters and really like you know messed up and interesting ideas but like it also feels more just joyful to be inside different people without someone pontificating and like lecturing uh, all yeah. the time you kind of be the one that shows you what the right thing is and i think that's why the third volume was my least favorite of the three was because of um, having to tie all the ends for the plots, uh, the narrative I felt was um, a little uh, more kind of funneled into serving that. It was constrained into serving that. Whereas in the first books, it was just like kind of wild and free and it felt <laughs> aimless and amazing. And, you're, and by the end of it, it's like we're racing to get to that, to that, to that finish line. And so things had to, it started kind of feeling like what was happening in those vignettes was serving the plot more so than just letting us explore. That's like sort of before. the V, the V pinch inside of it to me though, too, where yeah. it's like the freedom is going to be restrained. The yeah. form restrains itself. Like the, the nature of it being a novel restrains itself uh, because it has to follow, it has to finish up these ways or else it won't be deemed successful. Well, you, well, you have like no audience. Like what kind you of, have no audience. How many people like to read a book where it's just like, I have no idea where it's going and yeah, it's over. I, I don't know what happened. That's what I'm trying to work on this weekend is 81, 81 pieces that don't meet and add up to 80. <laughs> yeah. Fucking great. Um. <laughs> how did it, um, how did it work for you as a from like a publisher side of it, um, having the climax kind of take place like basically like it's not in scene necessarily. Yeah, I like that. You like that? I do like that because I think it I think it's closer to what happens. Most stuff happens off screen here. Like yeah. as we've talked about a lot of times, like. The Celeste scene, uh, even Celeste's like brutal scene is still a little bit off screen in the sense that we're seeing it through Max recounting it. Yeah, it's and, mostly and tempering it and yeah. tempering it. Being like they went fucking crazy. Or um, seeing after the aftermath. Right. Yeah. We see that we don't like this like semen being cleaned up. You don't see the act of the rape taking place, more of the because I think in the same thing with with uh the massacre it's the massacre is not what's important it's it's the aftermath of what it did to the people and to the movement it was what i think what she was maybe going for in, yeah. in telling it that way and I, I like that as well i like that quite a bit i know cinematically it's gonna suck uh if you do it that way but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd be curious but, and but yeah. novelistically it works great but it works yeah it works really yeah. good in that in that way especially because it does give you a chance to have it's like that old school uh not exactly but sort of like the theory of writing soap operas where like mm -hmm. you never have a thing on screen happen you instead have each character tell another character about it so that, that character can have their reaction to it and those yeah. two can be fleshed out it's much easier than having everyone in the room and someone kill someone no way or rebuild yeah. rebuild a kill it's much better to like do it one on one on one on one on one for forever yeah, but no, this is this has been a, a fun, wild ride. Um, I have not read a single word of Virginie Dupont before this, and so I'm glad to have read her essays and all three of these. I, I feel like I'm a better person for it, um, and I love I love recommending lo love recommending her to people as well. Yeah, yeah, I she's, do. A, she's a cool voice. That, and it's it's a type of artist we need out there right now. Kind of like a don't give a fuck feel which is mm -hmm. nice right now because i feel like so often we have to kind of step on eggshells as artists because we're worried about if we offend or if we and it, it, it was nice to have something be a little bit more raw uh, yeah. like have some of those kathy acker type vibes it's, it's kind of cool like a, a love it or a love it or hated artists I, are really cool ones for me i like that anyone being able to be willing to write despicable people in such a honest and be compassionate towards monsters yeah. right yeah i like it i like it that's a very it seems very rare instead of it usually feels like it's set up as like two rights that don't quite line up and there's some middle yeah. thing rather than like these people are clearly like we disagree with them she disagrees with them yeah so 
and that's interesting because it is it does really devolve the or devolve it de um it de teeths the whole like auto fiction set of readings for any book like would like the, there's no character in here who is Virginie Dupont. Yeah, I mean the closest one would be the one who has to write the fucking TV show. <laughs> like, oh no, <laughs> I forget. Um, was hyena at the convergence? Yeah, she was. I so. Did she? Did she get got? I think she got. Yeah, I think she's gone. No, not the hyena. The well, hyena this, will live on. So here's another idea that I had when I finished it last night too was that the hyenas in an earlier book in apocalypse baby mm -hmm. and um some of the i don't know if they're other the other characters aren't necessarily but they're kind of typical of things and this is like kind of a, a summation supposed to be like a summation of all of her kind of literary world up until this point and in a way that massacre might be uh it could be taken could be read as like an artistic statement of intent that she's now murdered all of her her or her typical people or typical characters, characters she's relied on, the things that she's been doing, the tropes that she's been using. Like Pamela Kant's very much like a character that's in other books. They're like, there's certain things that are all there and she just murdered them all. And so maybe this is like a new start. Yeah, I've, I've done all I want to do with this. I'm done. Yeah, they all- Yeah, I was just- blown off. I, I could be completely wrong. Yeah, I usually am, but I was kind of getting some of those like Kilgore trout vibes from- uh, Mm -hmm. Hyena, wondering if she might be something that somehow pops up all over the place. Uh, yeah, in, in future works, you know, just kind of like a fun, reoccurring character that's outside of time and space in some ways. That would be fun. But she's like a fun detective in the in Apocalypse yeah. Baby, like the private investigator side of where she is. But when I when I get to read something for pleasure, um, just for fun, I, I think I'm gonna have to hit up Apocalypse Baby. That's gonna be on my list. It's fun. It's yeah. really fun. pretty things is really good too. Speaking of not being able to read things for pleasure, where are we going next? Well, I got to email some people, but next month I thought we'd have two special episodes in which we actually read journals. And we talked about reading an uh, issue of a public space and an issue of monkey business and just do that to see like what is in a full literary journal. Like I haven't read a literary journal as a product aside from like the Granta issues for the Spanish stuff. Like maybe ever. And I can't tell you, like I look, I look sometimes at journal things. I don't know what they're like. I don't know what it would be like to like actually look at that as a whole. So I think that would be fun. And then I we know get, what it's like to get rejected from a literary journal. That see? And I'm that's super experience. I'm super good at that. <laughs> like what makes up like an issue in that sense. Um and then it, then we move on to 2666, which will be a, a big fall reading. September onwards experience. Awesome. And so um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Monkey Business is, is it all Japanese? All Japanese, but it's also okay. public, public space. They're both, they're like sister publications. Okay. I mean, like, uh, uh, I, know, I think a public space has at least one translated story to each issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read it in a while, um, but yeah, we could, I don't know when their next issue comes out. I'm hoping that it is like just happens to be like right around now. Um, if she's still with the um, if she's still with the magazine, would you be able to get Bridget on? You yeah, think? I okay. think so. I've only seen her on panels and got to talk to her at a couple um, AWPs, and she's amazing. She's a wonderful champion for for like good literature. I'd, I'd be really excited to to chat with her if we could. Okay, so this is great. So the uh, the issue that's out right now, we'll just do this one. It's issue number 29. Um, and the subject says, in these times of fragments and fragmented times, what are the shapes of our comfort? Built and imagined. What gives boundaries and connection, healing and shelter, familiar pathways and points of rebellion? And there are pieces by Jumpa Lahiri, Colm Toibin, Clara Massoud, uh, other people I'm trying to see if I recognize, Stephen yeah. Melhauser. Do they have any like good writers? All yeah, these no, all really. these no, all these no-name short story writers and essays. Good lord, we got a murderer's row there. <laughs> I know. No, no wonder, uh, no wonder I always get rejected from that magazine. Holy cow! And then there's like four thousand uh, uh, people I don't know. Okay, Taisa Kidisiaka or Kidiskaya, Johanka Delgado, JJ Emma Wilson, Kamiko Han, Graham Faust. 
not, these people I'm not familiar with. So those are, those are all made up names. Those aren't real people. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I'm <laughs> pretty pissed off anyways and not pronouncing any of their names correctly. So yeah. there is that. And then there's also photography and art. So that's cool. Let's see what the monkey business one has. Monkey business. You can make up every name on this too. I'm not going to know any of the, I will not know any of these writers either. <laughs> I don't think I will either. And that's what I think is exciting about it. Yeah. Um, I want something new. That'd be fun. Yeah. So their most recent issue. Uh, ooh, uh, is that this one? No, that's, what is that? Okay. It's this one. Oh, but it is mixed stuff. There's like, uh, oh, Hideo Furukawa. Uh, yeah. Hiromi Ito, translated by Jeffrey Engels, who I know, and he's great. Um, Haruki Murakami, in conversation with someone. Okay. Uh, to, to Yoko Ogawa. So there are some that I know. There are a handful. So Saki okay. Natsumi. Um, but a, a good number of them that are just like not, just people who probably have like not been translated to full, have, have had a full book translated. So yeah, All so right. I think we'll, that. we'll announce that and have that set up for August. And then we'll put together a whole list for the Mammoth 2666 event. Fantastic. Looking forward it's to really it. Fun, Cause you've never read that. I have not. I read it when it, I read it in a galley when, um, when, FSG was doing that. That's at uh, Book Expo. They gave out over, I think it was four thousand copies of the Galley of twenty sixty six six, which is more copies than like most books we print. <laughs> it's just, like promotion, <laughs> and it's like you know nine hundred pages. Like it's not. It was not like a cheap thing to put together. I'll uh, I'll re say this when we do the episode, but um, I love that uh, Rodrigo blurbs twenty the. 2666, the first one that came out. Yeah. Um, that he blurred that one. And that he also blurred my my first book to come out. So it's like, yeah. Rodrigo for the win. Are you still there? Well, that'll end the show. Bye bye. <laughs>